Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Tonight we want to go through part two of our study in Genesis and the Dead Sea Scroll Cave 1. And I want to show you what I've been doing, uh, and then we'll see if there's questions from our chat room. Uh, so let me go first off to our website, and here's our biblefacts.org website, where we've got a home, store, and calendar. Down at the bottom here, or in the middle actually, we have our Dead Sea Scroll studies, and this is our master list that we've been using to do our studies. So if we click on this, I want to show you, I've expanded it a little bit. So over here, uh, a few more books on Dead Sea Scrolls. So we've got the Ancient Testaments of the Patriarchs, Book of Enoch, Book of Jubilees, Gad the Seer, and the Dead Sea Scroll Calendar. And those are books you can buy from Amazon. We've still got our uh, cave uh, 1 through 11, excluding 4 here, and cave 4 here. As you can see, I've been doing quite a bit more uh, research, so we've got uh, more scrolls to go through, or I'm going to show you what we've got anyway. And we've added a few more things up here. These are just PDFs you can download for free. And what we've been doing is, um, and this will be added all together eventually, but this is our uh, Old Testament by Dead Sea Scroll number. So if you click on that, it's just a PDF. But right now, we'll start here. So Genesis, the first one is 1Q1. And this is the parts of Genesis that are actually in that scroll. And we'll go on down. So we've got from all of the caves. And then when we get down toward the end, we have some of the commentaries uh, marked in red. And then we've got Exodus. And you'll see that on the thing we're studying. We've got Genesis and I think Exodus on there. But here's the same thing with Exodus. Um, and here are the scrolls that have supposedly commentary we'll get to eventually. Uh, and then Leviticus, just Leviticus. Now, in, in these things, like some of these will be the, the Septuagint version. It's not necessarily written in Greek. Sometimes it is, but it's the, the version that we have in the Septuagint. So if verses are flipped around or something like that. Uh, and some of them are in Hebrew and some of them are in Paleo-Hebrew etc. So, and then we've got Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the Temple Scroll might end up being good commentary or going along with Deuteronomy. And then we've got Joshua, and so there's two major scrolls of Joshua, and two major commentaries, or pieces of a commentary. We'll have to see what that is when we get there. Uh, Judges, Ruth, and then for 1 Samuel, this is what I've been doing this last week. So just making sure we get all this stuff together. So eventually we will have all of this in a PDF form that you guys can have. And you'll notice it's not much different. It's basically our Old Testament with pieces cut out just because it's fragmented. But occasionally there will be differences, and that's what we've been looking at recently. And Kings, not much from Kings, just three scrolls. Chronicles, one scroll. Ezra, one scroll, Job, and then the Psalms. We've got a lot of that. Some of them have the Psalms in a different order, which may or may not be interesting, but we'll see. Um, and some of them have, like this one is the Psalms plus part of the prophecy of Joshua, so that might be more of a commentary that goes up top. And, okay, then we've got some pro Proverbs, just two scrolls, which has these Proverbs in it. Two for Ecclesiastes, a few for the Song of Solomon. Then the Isaiah scroll, and we all know about 1Q Isaiah, which is the entire book uh, in its entirety. However, it may have differences in it, or extra sentences or commentary. And then Isaiah B, which is this stuff. And then uh, several other scrolls where we have all this. So, and 4Q60, I thought that was interesting, has a, to date, an unknown verse out of uh, that. So, it'll be interesting to see all these things. And then Jeremiah, I was working a little bit in Jeremiah today, trying to pull this stuff together. Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, the minor prophets, uh, all those put together and other things that may be related, and that's it.
but that's basically our list of scrolls that have Bible passages that for the most part is just Bible passages. And 99% of those are identical with what we have. But that's our starting place. We're going to try to pull all of that together and then find um, commentary, if possible, and put in with those things. That'll give us one, probably close to half of the scrolls all put together uh, where we can just look at it real quick and see if there's anything interesting. So if we have the Bible scrolls with the commentary, the patriarchs, and then the um, calendar, those are large segments of a, a lot of scrolls kind of put together, finished in one category. Then what's left will be uh, the prophecy, extra biblical prophecies, and their history. I think the history is going to be really interesting to look at. Um, and then whatever else is in there. But um, this easy stuff takes a lot of time just comparing, basically. So let me exit out of that. So again, on our study, that's our uh, DSS Old Testament or Old Testament by Dead Sea Scroll number. And that's where we've been doing. So we've had a lot more here for Genesis, Exodus, trying to get through the Torah. So if we go here, we'll start off where we left off last time. This is our DSS Old Testament. Okay, and so it's Genesis, and it's, this is what we had before. I haven't updated it yet. Genesis, and I think Numbers. Or Genesis and Exodus, rather. And then this is that DSS, the same thing, but just for Genesis, I believe. So what we did last time... One of the things I've changed, too, I was thinking it was too much red. So this is still the same, but in the next updated edition, things like this, that is the um, word that was there. So in this case, it, our text says, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place. Well, there says in one collection. So having everything in red is kind of hard to read for some people. So I'll take, uh, excuse me, I'll take this, if I can click on it right, and change that to gray. So it's gray lined out and then red underlined. So that'll make it easier to see. Um, so last time we went through and we saw Genesis, and you can get this on the regular Dead Sea Scroll Bible PDFs or books that you go out and buy. Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And Genesis 6, 13 to 21 was there. And through the commentaries, we're able to add verse 3. And we didn't have anything at that point because we weren't looking at the commentaries. In Genesis 7, 8, um, 9, and I think we had 11 or 12, one of the two. And so we've got that, but then we didn't have anything up to 21. So now we've got 14, 15, and on down. So we'll look at some of this stuff. So we got up to the commentary in here in Genesis 7, 8, and 9. And the commentary was pretty interesting because it re reproduced what was said, identical. But it went ahead and added that it was uh, like the 14th day of the seventh month the third day of the week. So it actually added dates from their calendar. Uh, so we have, for instance, the day of the flood then was in the 600th year of Noah's life on the 17th day of the second month, which was the first day of the week, which is Sunday. So pulling all that together, it was Sunday, ER 17, 1656. So 1,656 years after creation, uh, 17th of the second month. And what we what we noticed last week, I think I mentioned this to you, mentioned it in our Tuesday night Bible study, because um, we're doing the same thing as, as we are here. Um, but it was interesting that it was Sunday, ER 17, because Sundays are interesting anyway uh, for this kind of stuff, Sunday and or the Sabbath, just to see what what's on which. But... When we were looking at that, since the Dead Sea Scroll calendar always starts its um, four quarters, 
with a tekufa on a Tuesday. Wednesday is always the first day, f- first full day of whatever season that is, the first day of spring, summer, etc. So that being the case, it's exactly six and a half weeks later that you would have the mid-seasonal break. So if you go down from, from Wednesday, six, and a half, six weeks, and then go to a half, it's always on a Sunday. So um, whatever day you have for the first day of the season, you go into the second month, a month and a half, you know, down, and it's that Sunday, which would be the 17th every, every single time. So um, mid-spring, summer, winter, and fall. And so I thought that was interesting. So that means the flood actually occurred mid-spring um, on the, the exact mid-spring day. Now, I don't know if that means anything or not, but I thought it was really interesting. And someone had asked me, <clears throat> as I taught before, that Halloween is an ancient memory of the flood. And so if that's the case, how come they're saying it's in the spring? And it has to do with all that calendar confusion. So in this case... They're saying that the the year starts in the spring, which means the 17th of the second month would be mid-spring. Now, if, on the other hand, you went by what the rabbis say, which is that the calendar starts in in fall, first of Tishrei, then the 17th of the second month would be the um, mid-fall, which for us is right around October 31st, so... Um, And so that's the deal. You mix those two up, and now all of a sudden you get the flood occurring in the fall rather than the spring, or mid-fall instead of mid-spring. And so that's interesting because then the pagans that follow the lunar calendar and the modern Jews that follow the lunar calendar basically have that flipped around, and that's why you have, uh, like in Mexico, the Day of the Dead celebrating that kind of stuff uh, being in the fall. But it's just a difference in the in the calendar. So, for instance, you've got some church fathers correctly teaching what I believe, I believe to be correct, that is, that Jesus was born on the 15th of Tishrei, the beginning of tabernacles, since he tabernacled among us. If that's correct, you could understand why some church fathers then misunderstood the 15th of the first month and said he was born on Passover. That's very logical because... Instead of looking at the fall, they're looking at the spring. And then you would also have other um, church fathers that are Latin fathers that are in Europe uh, that mix up the Festival of Lights because there's one Festival of Lights, which is uh, Tabernacles, so that'd be the 15th of Tishrei. And then there's another Festival of Lights, which would be the first day of Hanukkah, which would be December 25th. So that being the case, it seems very logical that in the West you have the birth of Christ thought of as being Christmas or December 25th. And in the Far East, you have some people thinking it's Passover and everybody else saying, well, no, this is probably Tishrei. And it's the only way that those could both be an accidental understanding of the same text. So just like Halloween, Um, the actual flood would have been in the spring if their calendar is correct, and I believe it to be. Uh, If you're talking about the modern Jewish calendar starting in the fall, then it would be where we put Halloween. So just FYI on that. So a lot of these things that are kind of confusing seem to be cleared up when we use the right calendar. Um, So it's just really interesting. And then you take their calendar design as you go through and see things, what Moses was doing, what Jesus was doing, something happened so many days later, something else happened, you instantly begin to see a lot of things. Um, And they always work out right if you're using the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. So pretty amazing stuff. So this gave us a lot of those things. Um, The water, you know, the tops of the mountains were finally seen on Wednesday to Vet 1, which is the winter day of remembrance, first day of winter. And um, last Tuesday was Groundhog Day, uh, which is where we celebrate the 2nd of February, where we celebrate midwinter. And on their calendar, of course, it would have been the Sunday before. 
So just a couple of days earlier. So now we're into uh, that, even though this week seems to be the coldest uh, in a long time, many years that I can remember being in Kansas, we're in single digits, you know, and a few times, one or two of the nights, it's actually going to drop below zero. I remember that happening quite often when I was a kid. And then for the last couple of decades, it just doesn't happen in Kansas that much if, you know, maybe one or one or two nights, but not steadily for a week. That's very, very unusual. Anyway, but we're on our way towards spring. And so when spring comes, we will finally have uh, our New Year's and start the new new year. What our fellowship is doing, as a side note, is uh, we're going to start observing the tekuvas, not in super ritual form. The Jubilees basically just says that you're supposed to get together with family and have a feast, you know, a potluck or something like that, and talk about prophecy. It, has there been a prophecy fulfilled since the last season? Uh, what's the Lord doing? New moves of the Lord? You know, what is he doing? How can we be involved? And then also repentance if necessary. What are your plans in serving the Lord for the next three months? And so we're going to start doing that, just have a potluck and do that too. So I encourage you to kind of do the same thing. Be really careful with trying to start doing rituals, though, uh, like killing a Passover lamb or doing some sort of other Jewish ritual. Um, even if it's not corrupted and you're doing it exactly right, you're not supposed to really be doing that. So because uh, we're not Zadok priests. But we could always get together to study. That's always a good thing. And to fellowship and focus on prophecy. So going on down here, we've got, I think we looked at all of these. And then we got to Genesis 9. And I think that's where we left off. So we'll kind of start there tonight. Genesis 9, it says what we have there is we're missing verses 1 to 23. And starting in verse 24, it says, Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him, and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, Canaan shall be his servant, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he will dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And those are kind of cryptic. We've always wondered what that is. And we got this not from the actual Bible passages, but from the commentary on Genesis. So when we go down and look at this, it says basically the same thing. That he awoke from his wine, knew what his youngest son had did to him, and said, Cursed be Canaan. A slave of slaves will he be to his brothers. He in the commentary says he did not curse Ham, but Ham's son, that'd be Canaan, because God blessed the sons of Noah. And where it says, In the tents of Shem may he dwell, that means, and then that part's kind of cut off. Now, we can kind of fill in the blanks for this because we have, and we've already done this for you, we've pulled together the Testaments. So just to rem remind you, the theology of the Essenes teaches that the, the, te the patriarchs, rather, which is Adam through Aaron and maybe others, but at least that 40 or some group of people, all were basically prophets, heard from God, and wrote a last will and testament to their kids which is mainly about moral issues. Don't do this because you get in trouble. Believe me, this is what happened to me. And it also contains really good moral lessons, helps us see into the, to the, the ancient mind with the idioms that they use. But then it also talks about prophecy. So it's really interesting. And we put that together for you, Ancient Testaments of the Patriarchs. But I mention that because in this case, people always wonder, why did Noah, did he get drunk? What does it mean, his wine? What does he knew? He knew what, what Ham did to him, but he cursed Canaan. And he wouldn't want to curse Ham, but why did he curse Canaan? What's Canaan got to do with it, of something that Ham did? So what's the story behind it? And it's cut down, so we don't know the full story. Well, in the Testaments of the Patriarchs, then, we have part of the... Um, Testament of Noah. Now, if their theology is correct, and if they had the original documents or copies of the original, not made up stories, then we have the last will and testament of 
Noah and some of the other guys. So this would have actually been a fragment of a book that Noah wrote, Noah, the actual guy. Uh, you know, the Pharisees are going, to, are going to say that those really did exist, but they've been lost, and the stuff that the Essenes have is made-up stories. And the Essenes always say, no, that's real. Your oral Torah is made-up stories. And we wouldn't even know where to begin, who's right or wrong. Maybe they're both wrong, except when we compare the, the teachings from the oral Torah and the patriarchs to the New Testament— without trying to absolutely prove it clinically per se, but because I'm a Christian, I believe the New Testament. So if it contradicts the New Testament, I'm going to throw it out. If it supports the New Testament, I'm going to say it's correct. So here you've got documents that are 100 to 200 BC that teach, the, according to the patriarchs, that there would be a Messiah, he would be God incarnate, he would come and die for us to somehow reconcile us to God. It pays the penalty for our sin nature, as the text says. And this event happens one Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee of their age, which is 32 AD. Again, the calendar came in handy, uh, trying to figure these things out. So you've got all these things, he's born of a virgin, etc., exactly the way the New Testament says it happened. They say this is what's supposed to happen. New Testament said it did exactly the same way. The oral Torah says that the Messiah is not God incarnate. He's just a general. He's not born of a virgin. Uh, he doesn't die for our sins. The Messiah didn't come, etc. That goes against the New Testament. So using the New Testament as my guide in faith, of, in faith I'm going to reject the oral Torah, at least those parts of it, and follow the Testaments. Okay, so that being said then, the Testaments become very, very important. We don't want to add it to Scripture. It's supposed to be its own separate, if you want to call it a pre-canon canon. It's, it's pre-Moses. So the writings they had pre-Moses are very important, but you don't add it to the Old Testament. Just like you don't add the Old Testament to the New Testament. They're separate canons. And the things in the 400 silent years is what we're trying to study. That's this stuff. Um, that's extremely important for us today, but we still don't want to add it to the Old Testament or to the New Testament. It, it's its own thing. Commentary. Call it commentary, just like Josephus. Josephus is very important to look at the stories and the history in it, but we don't want to add it to Scripture. So based on this, I want to remind you that part of the Testament of Noah basically says that... Um, you use wine and um, a meal offering and I think a calf and uh, sheep or goats or whatever, depending on the ritual you're doing, uh, for the Melchizedekian sacrifices and observing the festivals. And so this was the, um, the festival of Pentecost, of which this would be occurring, and things like that happen. And he mentions that in there. So he does not get drunk. But they they consistently used wine as a way to go to sleep. Um, so if you're working in the fields too hard, sometimes you just can't go to sleep. The wine will help relax you and you'll go to sleep. So he wasn't drunk in any way, shape, or form. He wasn't sinning. But he does the ritual. Uh, the wine helps him sleep. Um, being full of you know a nice steak and potatoes helps too. So anyway, he goes to sleep, and according to the testament of Noah, he has a prophetic dream. He wakes up and realizes, you know, when you have those dreams, it's like, this doesn't seem like just me. I want to investigate this. And if the dream was something bad happened at a certain place, you would carefully send someone over there to kind of spy it out and see if, is there anything even there? And so part of the dream was, and it's very specific, is that Ham concocts this idea of trying to take over Shem's territory, to expand his. And part of the entire thing, there, there's a whole lot to it, but just real briefly, Nimrod will go up to the um, east and come in this way and attack Japheth's group. 
Canaan will go up along the coast and create cities and start an invasion, not actually attack anybody, but create cities, posts where you could get, say, like, um, well, the first one he did was Zidon, and Zidon was the, the way it's made up there, was made up there, uh, is the perfect place to have a uh, fleet of ships come in. Okay, so he's starting that kind of stuff. Ultimately, these two are going to join together and try to take over, and they actually do. And if it wasn't for the Lord intervening at the end of the age, that would be the apostasy that would destroy everything. And that's and he was told that you can't really trust Ham or any of his people. Japheth is okay, but he's not going to be a stand-up person. When push comes to shove, you probably can't trust him to totally. Shem is the one that you can trust completely, and he's to be ordained the next Melchizedekian priest, and that through him and his lineage, the Messiah would come. And that was what the dream was. So he wakes up, and he's really rattled. So he sends people very quietly to see, I mean, up there, there shouldn't be anything but wilderness, has Canaan or anybody for that matter started an establishment up there. So he very carefully sends someone up just to spy it out, don't do anything. The report comes back, yes, there's actually a settlement there, there's ships there, somebody's doing something. We didn't stick around to ask who, because who knows? I mean, that's... And so then another report comes back from the east that skirmishes are starting with Hamites and Japhethites up there. So when you have a dream that this is going to happen, and the two starting points, you send spies out to look, and it's actually already started, then you know the rest of the dream is real. So he ordains Shem and begins preparations for, for that kind of stuff. So now you can see where he, once he realizes what this is, he's going to say he knows what Ham has designed, what Ham has done with the two coastal invasion, the coast invasion and the other invasion. And Canaan is the one invading the te his territory at this point. And so he curses Canaan. Theoretically, he would be cursing Nimrod also, because in the dream there were these two people. And they're not mentioned by name, but they were... In the, in the dream, it was branches of a tree. See, the family tree branches out into three major branches. So it'd be Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then two splinter groups come off of the lower one, which would be Ham, and attack the top one is what the dream was. And then there's an, an angel interpreting it, etc. So that's what that's going doing here. So again, we see this kind of stuff. And so now we understand that the prophecy back in the book of Enoch, it was prophesied the Messiah would come through a, a nation established uh, for that purpose, special nation. It's the plant, as, as it's called in the prophecies. But he would come in the 70th generation from Enoch, so he's a long ways off. But now you know he's going to come through Noah, because Noah's the father of the three kids. But which one of the three kids? And you don't know until this dream comes, and now you know it's Shem. So it's Shem, Arphaxad, Shelah, and then Eber. And Eber becomes extremely dedicated to the Lord. And so Shem and Eber then continue or, or start and continue a yeshiva or the teaching of all the old prophecies and those things. And it continues down until Abraham, which is a totally other story. We see that in part of Abraham's testament and from Genesis. But then Shem realizes Abraham is the one and blesses Abraham. And it actually starts, the covenant starts with Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob to start the nation of Israel where the Messiah would come from. And then you go Jacob, Levi, Kohath, Amram, and then Aaron and Moses. And then the rest of it is history. That's when it, where Genesis starts. So this is all leading up to it, and we, we know that. When you get to, to Jacob and he splits up the pieces, the Messiah then we know will come through Judah. And so again, it keeps a bit narrowing as it goes. So so many generations down from Judah will be the virgin-born Messiah. And then it goes down and it narrows again with um, David. So very interesting. Lots of interesting stuff in the scrolls. 
But so we know that from the testament. So now looking back at this, we can kind of see why 4Q252 says what it does. And then it just mentioned that Terah was 140 years old when he left Ur and entered Haran. If you go look that up from Genesis, that would be correct. So it's nice to see the dates in here or the ages or the year counts between end up being correct. So then we get to chapter 12 and we don't have a whole lot in there. One thing in chapter 12 I thought was interesting, and some of these can be typos, and we don't know if the Mesoretic text has the typo or this has the typo. In this case, we're talking about Abram departed, and the Lord uh, told him, uh, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him, and then Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And our text says Abram, because his name hasn't been changed yet. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says Abraham. So in my guess, I'm thinking this is a typo in the Dead Sea Scroll. doesn't really matter, because Abraham becomes Abram, or Abram becomes Abraham, rather. But it's really interesting. And so this is kind of interesting, too, because the 70 and 5, we have uh, texts that seem to indicate 70, and others that seem to indicate 75, as far as the prophecies go. And basically, he came, he start, he's called of God when he's 52. And then they have the problems, and they come to Haran, and then he sp spends 14 years, I think, there at Haran. And then he goes down to Canaan just to kind of check the place out, because he's being told that's where he's going to go. And then he comes back, and he stays at Haran a little bit longer. And he's 75 when he finally goes down to Canaan as a permanent move. And even that's not really permanent, because as soon as there's a famine, he goes down to Egypt and then comes back. And then there's another famine, and he goes to the Philistines, and he comes back, you know. So, and that's what you got to do with famine. But you, you pick all these numbers and try to figure out which one starts the prophecies. But it's nice to see the same kind of stuff in here. Because sometimes it's a little confusing in Genesis. And if you hop over to, like, uh, Paul in Galatians 3, 16 and 17, and places like that, and um, Stephen's vision when he's talking, when he gets martyred, he mentions some dates. And so those seem to contradict Genesis. But according to the scrolls, you can kind of see where one's talking about a starting point, the other's talking about a finishing point. And it's completely explained sometimes in the scrolls. So it really makes everything come together well. Okay, anyway, so we got Genesis 4, or 14, talking about Kid Oliomer, 15. And here's the commentary, but it's kind of fragmented. Uh, 17 and 18, 19, 22. Now in chapter 22, we have, we're missing verses 1 to 9. We've got uh, verses 10 to... 15 and we're missing 16 to 24 but i thought this this is interesting here too to me i don't think it makes much difference but Abra our, our text would say abraham called the name of that place the lord will provide and in the dead sea scroll it says he called the name of the place god will provide now the word for god is usually el or elohim when you see the lord all in caps that's the sacred name of god so yehovah or however it was pronounced, you, you, there's there's the idea of Yehovah, Yahweh, um, Yahuwah. There's several different ideas, and nobody really knows for sure. It's a sacred name and should not be pronounced all the time. Um, anyway, that's a different story. But so in some of these places, you'll have God um, in place of the Lord, and in other times, you'll have the Lord in place of God. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But we're talking about the one true God, so it doesn't really matter. Genesis 23, 24. Okay, and then commentary 26, 27, 28, 30, and 32. See what it says here. Now, 
This is interesting, too, this commentary in Genesis 32. This, I'll just kind of mention this to you, and you can download or you know, download this and look at it or whatever. But in this commentary, it's, it's interesting because uh, some people have said it sounds like Jacob was trying to connive Laban, and Laban was trying to connive Jacob, so they kind of deserved what they got, so to speak. And this is the deal where he decides to separate the speckled in the bay and then the, the solid colored sheep and create more of the speckled in the bay. And then when Laban says, well, let's do the other way around because you're getting more sheep than I do, then he puts the speckled in the bay over here, doesn't let them reproduce, puts these together and makes them reproduce. So it's almost like he's creating the type of ones that he wants to do. Which, if, if that was the case, that would be like, I'm going to make sure every single newborn is speckled in bay so they can be mine. You want to change it, then I will make sure every newborn is solid colors so they'll be mine. That's cheating, so to speak. And it seems like Jacob is doing that, but in the commentary, it says that he was warned by an angel in a dream that Laban was going to try to do this in some way and so he was instructed to do what he did and so that makes the entire thing different so jacob's not trying to con anybody he's being warned that he will be conned so he's doing the opposite of what is expected of him so that he won't lose so someone won't cheat him out of stuff and we understand later on in genesis it gets to the point that um Laban followed, you know, and it says that they they did the uh, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from the other. I won't steal from you. You don't steal from me. And if you, any of us breaks that, may the Lord judge us. And the Targum actually says that Laban actually did later try to sneak back and cheat and God killed him for that. So it's an interesting, again, Targum, it may or may not be true, but it's an interesting story. But this is kind of the same thing here. Some people might say that the writers, the Dead Sea Scroll people, are just trying to make Jacob look better. And maybe, but again, these are the guys that got the prophecies right. So I kind of, it doesn't matter, but it's just interesting. So anyway, we get 33, 34, 35. And here in 35, uh, several places we'd have Jacob and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun. And in our text, you've got ands of all of them except for Simeon. For some reason, the and is gone. Dead Sea Scroll version has the and, which actually makes it all system. You know, it seems logical. So, and instead of people who were born to her, she bore people. So it's just a different tense. So it doesn't change the story. The rest of it, as you can see, almost all this stuff, we're missing verses 18, 20, and 23. But all the stuff that's there is word perfect. Um, explanation of who married who and why. 37, 30, no 38, but chapter 39, chapter 40. Uh, 41, this is where jo Jacob, 41? Yeah, 41. Uh, the seven thin ears and the seven thin cows. In here, they're called thin and blasted. So, or messed up, basically, or diseased. Again, the, the important thing is they represent the years and he interpreted them right. Um, so, we got a lot of that chapter. Chapter 42... 43, 45, 46, 47, 48. Um, they buried yeah, Rachel on the way to Bethlehem. Okay. And in this case, they took out and kissed them and put it over here. So they flipped the claws. It's the same exact thing, but instead of this, it's like that. Now this gets... I think this is a really cool part here. Okay, so this is chapter 49. I want you to pay special attention to this. This is really neat. This is where he's giving a blessing and giving us a, a kind of a minor prophecy to each one of the kids. 
So Reuben is the firstborn, and it goes on down. When we get down to here in verse 10, this says, and we're, we're very familiar with this, the, shep, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him, or to him, shall the gathering of the people be. It is identical, word perfect, from what we have in the Masoretic text, so the King James Old Testament, it's identical. But what's the commentary on it? How did they understand it? As a Christian, I understand that the king line of Judah will not stop until the Messiah comes. And it continued all the way down until um, it was taken from the Jewish leaders, the tribe of Judah rather, and given to um, uh, Herod, the Edomian. And in the t that time, when he became the very first person, while he was still reigning, the Messiah was born. And I, I, would, I would interpret the prophecy like that until Messiah or Shiloh comes. And this is interesting too. Shiloh is a place where they used to have the Ark of the Covenant and did the festival to Yahweh or to, to Jehovah. And it was the wine festival, the one that was on the third of Av. Uh, it had to do with the marriage ceremony and is one of the festivals that are that point to the age of grace somehow according to the text so anyway well how do they interpret this so if we go down to 24 let's just read it so it says this is the interpretation of that passage while israel has self-rule there will not be anyone cut off who sits on the throne of david for the staff represents the covenant kingship and the standards are the thousands of Israel. And so that won't happen until the Messiah of righteousness comes, who is the branch of David prophesied in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 and Zechariah 3, 8. For to him and his children, you know, he didn't have physical children, but we are his spiritual descendants. So to him and to us, have been given the covenant of kingship of his people for everlasting generations, which keep or have kept something, and then the law with the men of the community. So interpreting Torah the way the Essenes did. And this is interesting. So let's say this a different way. A ruler from the house of Judah will not stop being a ruler of the house of Judah until Shiloh comes, which means as soon as Herod the Great took over, the Messiah came, okay? And his children or his followers are the ones that will rule in covenant kingship. So no more does it matter if you're Jew or Gentile, but do you believe in Messiah? Are you in Messiah? And that covenant kingship is going to be uh, those who keep the law with the men of the community. So that's the Yahad or Serek. So in other words, we, according to this prophecy, if it's correct, or this commentary, we're following the scriptures the way the Essenes followed the scriptures and not the way the Pharisees followed the scriptures. Again, isn't that amazing? Looking at all the other texts, apparently we are. Uh, because we believe in Messiah, the virgin birth, his his death on atonement, the time of the death of the atonement, the effect of it, the coming of the age of grace, the Holy Spirit. So that's pretty cool. That is really, really cool. The congregation of the men, and then something about Nathan uh, is in there. Now again, according to the text given by the church fathers, Hippolytus, has a record of who ran the school of the prophets from Moses' time all the way down to John the Baptist, who anointed Messiah, and his group started at that point, his followers, his 12 apostles. And then the old school became corrupted by Gnostics, which is a fascinating story in of itself. But with that in mind, he mentions all the people that were headed the school throughout the 1500 years or so. Um, and so Nathan 
uh, Gad, Edo, Shemaya, um, and the other guy. Anyway, and then um, Ahijah. And um, Isaiah, several of the prophets. Um, not Daniel. Of course, he was gone. But anyway, um, many of those people were mentioned, and you've got this consistency. So the point is, then, if the Dead Sea Scrolls were kept by the School of the Prophets, then you would assume the leaders of those prophets who were actually prophets would have written a book, and it would be in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, whether we found it or not is irrelevant. It would have been there. And so we're told in Chronicles that Nathan and Gad wrote books of prophecy. So they would have been there, probably still are. Now, there are other places too, thank the Lords. That's how we've got the book of Gad the Seer. And I've got fragments of Nathan, but we can't seem to get the rest of it at the point at the moment. And Shemaiah and Iddo and Ahijah. So we don't have, I don't have anything of those. I know where they're at, one spot where they're at, but they're beyond my reach. So anyway, eventually we'll get them. But whether these other guys ever let them out or publish them is one thing they would have had to have been in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in the Geniza in Egypt, in other Dead Sea Scroll digs or something, we should be able to find them. So I thought that was interesting that they mentioned Nathan. Now the word Nathan means gift of Jehovah, Natan. So it might be, you know, something about them having a gift or giving something. But it looks more like it's a proper name at this point. So either way. But I just thought that was really cool. So in other words, the way they interpret um, verse 10, there won't be a lawgiver disappear from Judah until the Messiah comes. And unto him the gathering of the people will be. The Gentiles will be gathered to him. We will start a new kingship. And we will all be uh, following the teaching of Messiah, which will wind up being the way the men of the community have taught it, which is the way the patriarchs have taught it all this time. So in other words, the Christian is seen view as opposed to the Pharisee Sadducee view. Fascinating. Now again, we haven't really learned anything other than our brothers knew about us and we have forgotten about them. So, And then it goes on with other stuff, but there's very little commentary. And then here's Genesis 50. And that's all we have, verse 3 and verse 26. And so, okay, and so then on this one we have DDS by number. So by next week when we look at some more of these things, I will try to have at least uh, Exodus so we can start looking at them. And this should be completed on there like I showed you the other time.